Wait a minute, fella. Look here. Stand by. One for C-Lab, two for Troy Eagle, two for Wolverine to round out the trio in this episode. Everybody dies. Broadcasting live. From inside the power band, this is The Blah. In this episode, everybody dies. Welcome to the podcast, folks. I'm going to start talking about a movie. And at first, it's going to sound totally insane. But as I continue on, it's going to sound more and more rational. Your secretary, Iris, is going to come through the door in two seconds, by the way. She's going to offer you a cup of coffee. Your birthday is September 17th, 1963, right? Uh huh. You pulled some. <laughs> <laughs> the general pulled some strings to have your only son sent to Australia to hang out with C Lab at the Warhammer store, as far away from the fighting as possible. That's right, folks. This week on the Blah, we're talking about the 2014 science fiction, semi cult, awesome future classic, Edge of Tomorrow. Starring Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt, and our favorite actor in the world, Bill Paxton. Billy P. I'm your host, the Mulverine, along with my futuristic friends, Jar Higo. Kev, my middle name is Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Worst death ever. And of course, Sea Lab forever. What is up? So, Bill Paxton, man, I Bill so enjoyed seeing him. I just love, I love him. Same. In not one of his final, but close, close to yeah. his, one of his latter appearances. Uh, as we know, he passed away in 2017. Of course, we here at the EBD in Valverde are uh, deeply sad by that. I want to propose that we have like presidential portraits on the wall in the uh, hall of Valverde and it's just all of our favorite peeps and he's one of the oil paintings on the wall. Dude, I love it. Or maybe like all of the the ones that we've lost this year, like Brimley and Paxton mm. and, mm. you know, Dennehy. And Sean Connery. Zardoz commands it. I put a pair of Chuck Connors under the painting every time the previous pair wear away into nothing like flowers in a graveyard. Yes. Yes. I love it. Like you, like somebody sneaks yes. in in the middle of the night yes. and does it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I like it. I heard somebody say that Bill Paxton in this is like if his character from Aliens like continued to be in the military for 30 years and kind of got a bit salty and became a, became a master sergeant, and I love that idea. Yeah, I really like that too, man. He's kind of like a somewhat of a future version of Hudson, yeah. A mm, little bit. Not really, but enough to play along. No doubt, dude. Sure. I'll buy that for a dollar. Ah, uh, nice one. So high level on this movie. Give it to me. I loved this movie. I remember seeing the ad for this movie and, you know, the uber nerd in me was like, whatever, stupid, freaking Tom Cruise, whatever. And the name of the movie was dumb and the tagline was dumb. And I was like, live, die, repeat. I was like, here we go. You know, another dumb blockbuster that sucks. And man, I was just full of uh, warm feelings about it. And then I saw the movie and I was just blown away, man, at every single part of it. And I so thoroughly enjoyed it. I wanted to watch it twice this week just because I wanted to watch it twice. And uh, I only had time for one viewing, but I thought it was fantastic. I'll elaborate later. Somebody else can go. Oh, I'll go. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet. I agree with everything you just said. Oh, I love it. Now you're up there, Hegro. Oh, oh. (laughs) Didn't expect that timing. Yeah. What what's wrong with uh, Groundhog Day with Squid Ink, Noodle, Aliens and a full metal bitch who has a, a helicopter blade for a sword and uh Pretty sick. You know, everybody's favorite Scientologist, Tom Cruise. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of stupid, but it's also very entertaining and fun watch. Yeah, so entertaining. Yeah, the, the giant uh, sort of Titan weapon sword was great. And the, re- the reason behind it is great, too. You know, like she doesn't like running out of ammo, so she just fucks shit up with the sword. It's like, cool, that's pretty badass. 
and and it is actually a helicopter blade with a handle. So sick. Is it really? Yeah. Now, how did you know that? Is that a juicy like proto nug that we you found out? It's. I mean, you can see it. <laughs> you can see the two little mounts on the end of it that look like a rotor. Yeah, and then yeah, it is. It is all over the interwebs too. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm gonna just go ahead and take a death there. <laughs> it's to, it's to be known. But, it's yeah. got a helicopter blade for a sword. Is that true? Is that re- how do you know that? Uh, look at it. It's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I didn't notice until this last watching, and I've seen this movie a couple times. So no, it's all right. Let Kev die. It's cool. I was like, oh, or it may not be a helicopter blade, but it's like a you know a VTOL blade or whatever you know, like the the yep, the quad. Quad Vertical drop uh, vehicles. Vehicles, yeah. Sorry, you were dropping some heavy uh, military termage there. Didn't quite catch that. I caught up, though. Come on, Tars. Come on. Come on, Tars. Come on. That, that is why we got to do Interstellar, man. Some McConaughey up in here. I'm forever going to think of you suited up in elbow pads and knee pads and rollerblades behind the bookshelf yelling at a Sunny D commercial. That was fucking. Uh. That was a good. That was a nice one. He's in the fridge. <laughs> in the fridge exactly Murph he's in, in the back of the fridge you can see every time some dorky kid opens the door up he's like nudging the bottle but I feel like there could be a, a YouTube video there man mashing up uh, that scene from Interstellar with the Sunny D I think that would be pretty good oof something there for sure perhaps something that only fans of the show would get but I love that kind of stuff so <laughs> I love it's it funny. too man I don't know I kind of feel like if you had just just the mashup just the Sunny D mashup with Interstellar. I think it would be funny on its own, even without knowing about the show. Like, yeah, I think you'd pick up on it. You got to have Kev like with like the right hair and a little bit yes. of makeup, mm. like in a facsimile of the uh, you know the hyper matrix or whatever that uh, yeah. uh, he's in for that scene. But he has to be like, no, no, come on, not the purple stuff, not the purple stuff. <laughs> totally, <laughs> the sunny D, the sunny D. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just screaming, Sunny D. Come on, come on, come on, Tars, come on, Murph, come, come on. on, Murph, come on, pick the Sunny D, Murph. <laughs> come on, Murph, pick the Sunny D. So, anyway, Edge of Tomorrow. My, don't make me take my shirt off. <laughs> let's talk Tom Cruise for a second, just because. Let's, like, yes, let's talk about him. I don't know, man. I was so conflicted with Tom Cruise for so long, and now I'm just like, he seems like a pretty, pretty solid dude. I think he's moved away from all the crazy shit, and I, I just like, I definitely got to give the guy props for all the stunt stuff. I definitely got to give him props for that. Well, no doubt. I, wait, let me just let's back up for one second. I, I got to get this cleared up. Is this the first Tom Cruise movie we've done? Uh huh. It is. Oh man. Wait, wait, wait. This is a Bill Paxton movie, motherfucker. Sorry, so sorry. Let's get that straight first. But Tom Cruise is in it, so. Firstly, for the and for the folks at home, yes, Jar he goes right. This is a Bill Paxton movie. Period. Yeah. Secondly, also starring Tom Cruise is this uh, the first also starring Tom Cruise we've done? Mm-hmm. Yep. I don't think we've done any other Tom Cruise. We haven't. Wow, I don't think so either. This is really okay. Well, this is pretty epic, man. To use a really played out word, it's a good. It's a good place for for a Tom Cruise. Chad, uh, please continue on the, the the thread of your conflictedness about Tom Cruise because I have a similar story to tell. I think so. Do I? I just I just like bought into the uh, you know the, around the time he was jumping on Oprah's couch and South Park was making fun of him and stuff like just like bro, you've lost your fucking mind. Like chill the fuck out. But I don't know. I find now that he seems like a solid try hard guy and. I love the fact, I think one of the key reasons why I feel like he's like a try hard dude is he does all his own stunts and like he takes his craft seriously and it, he's the same shit in a lot of movies and stuff, but I don't know. I've grown to have a, a respect for and fondness for his uh, work ethic at least. And um, mm. I have more sympathy maybe for the uh, weirder times in his life than than kind of eye rolliness for it. And I I don't know, I kind of enjoy an odd Tom Cruise movie from time to time now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, man, I, I, you know, like there's stuff about Tom Cruise that I love and there's stuff about Tom Cruise that I'm just like, you, you cheese dick, you know, like the, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Like the grin he gives Emily Blunt at the end of Edge of Tomorrow, you know, I'm like, that's the kind of expression that would get you punched in real life. 
It's true. <laughs> but I got to give it to the guy, man. He really walks the walk, man. He does these roles in these crazy action movies. He does all of his stunts. You know, you can't really take anything away from him there. And he's good. And he actually, one thing I really like about him is he seems to have a sense of humor about who he is, you know, mm. and he's willing to take on some goofy shit. Like one of my favorite things I've seen him do was, uh, uh, Christ, I wish I could remember the character name, but, um, in Tropic Thunder. So good. He plays like the, uh, the, the crazy, like Harvey Weinstein kind of producer with like huge Popeye forearms and like him just like dancing to, uh, like, I don't know. I think it's 50 cent or, or something, but, uh, he's just so good in that. And, I like that he doesn't completely take himself seriously. Mm. That might have been the turning point for me was that performance. That might have been where I was like, I kind of like this guy. Well, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll use that as my segue. I I feel similarly to you guys, like just kind of going, doing the timeline. Like I remember seeing him in Legend, right? You know, and I was like, you know, this is really good. And then some years later I saw he had a small part in taps and he was really crazy in that, you know, but it was good. Uh, risky business. I was never really like a big risky business fan. So, and I don't really know that movie that well, probably because of that, but like, you know, he was, he was great in outsiders, man. A lot of people forget that he was in outsiders, you know, uh, Coppola's movie that had all of those great actors when they were young. Oh, wow. And, uh, I would say, yeah. Yeah, you know, and like, I, I think Cruz to me falls into the same category as Brad Pitt. Like, he's such a superstar and he's he's such a good looking guy, you know, and I, I think people, it's it's easy to like focus on the shitty movies because, you know, people kind of inherently want people to fail. Like, they people like to see people climb up and then like, they just want to knock them down with a baseball bat, you know, and it's like, kind of a shittier side of like people, but you know, and and then when you start factoring in like, you know, all the Scientology stuff and people just really started wailing on him, dude. But at the end of the day, this is about watching his movies. Right. And I don't really care what he does with his personal life at this point. You know, it's like, is it weird? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You know, I, I think that, like just trying to strip that away and look at his movies. Like he's really done some great movies, like a movie that I've watched recently a couple times because I just, it's so good. And I keep going back to it is the firm, which of course also has Wilford Brimley in like one of the only roles that Wilford Brimley played like a really bad dude. And Tom Cruise is really excellent in that movie. You know, like I really legitimately enjoy watching his performance. It's so good, you know, and he plays the young lawyer to the T man, you know, and there's other great movies, man. Like rain man is a, it's a pretty damn good movie too. I mean, you could easily say that it was like, Oh, it was Dustin Hoffman, but it was like, you know, he, he, he had to play the straight part dude, you know, and he did a good job of it. And, uh, there's been a lot of other ones. I really liked oblivion. I loved what he did with tropic thunder, you know, and, 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 you know, just the MI series. I mean, my biggest complaint about the MI series is that I think it sh- always should have been more like the TV show. And that's the way the original, the first one was, but then they got away from that as they went on. And that's fine. But like, y- you can't deny that the the Mission Impossible movies aren't great. I mean, Chad, you lo- you always talk about that one, not Rogue Nation, maybe, or maybe it is Rogue Nation, I don't know. But there's one that you've talked about a few times. Fallout, maybe? Nah, I only like the first one, but yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, the first one is my favorite still because it so sticks to that kind of feel of the original show because I, I used to watch reruns of the show back as a kid. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I get what you're saying about Tom Cruise. Like, it's the same kind of thing. And, and sure, he's had some crappy movies, just like Brad Pitt, but I think when you're that level of star, like, it, those bad ones seem to stick out more because people jump on that shit and they just, like tear it apart and you know exploit the wound and open the wound and all of that sort of thing so Mm -hmm. i don't know i dig him and i i really enjoyed him in this one i thought he was so good man like he plays a he plays a great total chicken shit in the beginning of the movie and then like he totally turns into a legit badass man and some of those battle scenes like once we get like you know a hundred redos in or whatever like he is just fucking whomping on those creatures man and 
dialing it the fuck in. And like one of the last times he does the drop ship, you know, the guy looks at him and he's like, aren't you going to wear a helmet? And just like the look that he gives him, he's like, no, it's a distraction. I was like, damn, dude. So yeah, kudos to Tom Cruise and his work in this movie. Yeah, the story arc here worth him being a chicken shit to to uh, fucking Neo or what? Ah, oh, god damn it, that's Matrix death is pretty awesome. God, it damn it, it is Neo. How did where did you even how did you even get there? Can you explain? Just because he's like because Neo is a chicken shit coder who then eventually is like oh, I see dead people and fucking stops bullets. You know, no. Oh, you mean the the guy the. The scientist dude is always in the the engine room or whatever. Will Ferrell? No, I mean actual Keanu. Like, um, he's a fucking coder who's like, no way, man, this is so crazy. And then fucking by the end of it, is flying around to Rage Against the Machine songs. You know what I mean? I got. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. I see the analogy now. Sorry. Yeah. I liked what you were saying. I think it was you, Kev, before about how you saw the trailer and were like, "Yeah, this looks so dumb." Like yeah. the the story, and like you said a little bit too, Benny. Like it's kind of it's kind of a dumb story, but like super entertaining. And so the Groundhog Day nature of it is kind of at first you're just kind of like whatever. But maybe it's the pacing of it. Maybe it's just the way that it's action packed. But I I found I just got on board. You know, like if handled poorly, you would have just been like whatever. This is dumb, and it would have been exactly what you thought watching the trailer, and it would have been just some bullshitty you know, blockbustery studio pissing money into a bad idea, but something about it, like it just, it worked, you know, something about the, the groundhog day stuff worked pretty quickly and get you on board. Cause this is, all it is, is just groundhog day with fucking pew pew lasers, you know? Well, yeah, I think that's one way to look at it for sure. And I, there's no question that I thought about that numerous times during the course of the, uh, the film, but I think there's more to it. I feel like the, and just from the, the few things that I read a few years ago when I watched this was that it sticks close to the story in the book, but I, I didn't realize there was a manga until just like today. But um, my understanding is that it sticks pretty close to the story in the in the novel. Obviously, they can't do it all, put all the detail in there. But uh, I, I don't know. I think I kind of would have I kind of would have leaned into the like. Um, you know, leaned into the novel a little bit more maybe and um, made it kind of less Groundhog Day with Pew Pew lasers. You got to admit, dude, the Pew Pew sounds for some of those guns were sweet. Dude, you got to drop that early nugget of it's the actual sound from aliens. Wait, what? I think they took the sound effect from the fucking big waist-mounted uh, gun and used it in this. Really? Yeah, I saw that somewhere. So I'm pretty sure. I'm, I don't know if it's confirmed, but I'm just going to assume it is. Well, we had, hmm, we had another nugget like that about RoboCop like a week or two ago. There you anyway, go. I, I don't know. Yeah, like, aliens like, had some very unique sound design for the guns. But. Totally. No yeah. doubt. <clears throat> really, really good, too. I think, um, like, you know what I'm saying, though? Like, I, I think this, the concept was, I think, to say it, I'm trying to say it a little bit more clearly because I'm kind of thinking on my as I'm walking here. Like, um, the this I really dug the concept, and I thought the concept was pretty fresh and interesting and original. And I wish they would kind of maybe leaned into that a little bit more, so it didn't quite have that groundhoggy pew pew laser feel. How would you, how would you lean into it more? I don't know, and I don't even know if I'm right. I'm I'm kind of just oh yeah yeah I understand vomiting brain vomit you know but i don't know it, it, yeah i don't know somebody else talk i don't <laughs> i'm having a glitch in the matrix death whoa i don't really have a problem with the premise mm. you know um i don't know how original i think it is but it's well executed and it makes the movie fun sort of the yeah groundhog day aspect i don't really have a problem with that um I I thought the way they were conducting warfare was kind of fucking stupid, you know, like dropping people via cables uh, into a hot battle battlefield with like uh, power assist exoskeletons, I guess, like with guns mounted to it, like power assist exoskeletons. I, I just thought those were fucking stupid, man. I was like, why? Why? I mean, if you're going to go that far, why wouldn't you make like, there were so many deaths that could have been avoided by just like having some armor or protection involved. 
Mm. Or actually having some like aids for situational awareness besides like, you know, encumbering. It just seemed like an encumbrance, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and something that was, and, and also why is it powered with just like a battery, you know, like, I mean, why wouldn't it have like a like little nuke thing in there or something that just like, it's not going to, you know, like it's either going to blow up or it's going to keep going. You know, <laughs> if it's that desperate that people are like wired up to these things, like it just seemed kind of half baked to me. I don't know. I, I, you know what? Yeah, that's a really good point, man. And I think that, um, I, I was able to see through that. Like it didn't bother me as much, but it's totally legit. Like you're hundred percent right. Like it, it seemed, it, I think what you said that was perfect was that it was an encumbrance. Like, it seemed to me that they were clunky and they were plodding around. And like when all of that action was happening, like, you know, when you really see the most of it in the first couple of resets, like they're just kind of clumsily clanking around, you know, and they're just such sitting ducks, man. And, yeah, you know, it's not until later that we see with like, multi, you know, many, many sessions of training you know, like what we see with, um, the full Emily Blunt. Bench. Yeah. Full, me- <laughs> <laughs> full metal. Exactly. Full metal bitch. Oh, and, God, uh, so and, stupid. and Kate, it was so stupid and <laughs> cage too. Like he turns into like a total rocker, like, but it's like they're, they're, they've learned how to use the armor and it's just like, well, so what are they, they not train all these other people? Like, I don't know. It just, it, that the contrast just between that and combined with like what Ben said, like it just, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm with you hundred percent on that. I'm no tactician, but just, you know, if you just take that at face value, it just seems like a, not really like the best way to go about waging war against the, uh, squidding pasta aliens, you know? Mm, totally. This flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, I was just, I just caught like a little, a, a little tidbit on IMDb that's, that Emily Blunt was, you know, uh, having a difficult time filming the movie because the suit was 85 pounds, right? So let's just say real world, it's 85 pounds, right? For the armor. It's like, why wouldn't you just ditch the armor, forget about the batteries, walk on your two feet and carry some sort of futuristic pew pew machine gun with like, some kind of grenade launcher on it and just carry extra ammo. Like you'd be way better off. You'd be end up probably carrying half the weight and you'd be way more maneuverable and mobile. You know what I mean? Like the armor wasn't preventing them from dying. So no, it wasn't even doing anything to really protect them. It was just like, I guess so they could carry around more weaponry or or whatever. But you know, outside of like Emily Blunt, like, you know, like doing like a robot gymnastics with a uh, VTOL blade. Like nobody <laughs> else seemed like they were using it to any specific advantage really. You know, they're just kind of like clocking around, like, you know, unable to get out of their own way. Yeah. And it would have taken like, you know, many, many, many more hours of training for any of them to get really effective with the suits at all. I mean, granted Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt had the, the element of knowing because they were being reset all the time. You know what I mean? But even still, like the session where he's fighting the the drones in the base, you know, way towards the end. And then there's a couple of the beach scenes where he's just absolutely tearing the fucking place up, man. And it's it's really cool to watch. You know what I mean? But when you contrast it, you know, it makes you wonder, like, why does everybody else suck at using this thing? You know what I mean? Like, they're all just red shirts at that point. Yeah. You get it. it, it I feel like it it makes it plausible via the opening sequence where, you know, you've got your standard sci-fi opening newscaster montage, but one of the items there was Tom Cruise shilling the suits and being like, these suits are great. You need to buy them. The best example is Rita Vertasky, who on her first day killed a billion things. And in, in like, <laughs> it's just a fucking weapons system that they're trying to sell and... I feel like humanity doesn't know how to fight these things. So they're just like throw bodies at it and we'll stick them in these suits, you know? And it, it kind of makes sense in that, in that way. Like they're just fucking tactically. I completely agree are being fucking retarded in, in my armchair general judgment. But you know, it's, it. Yeah. I'm like, why, why not just, you know, traps, bombs and like, yeah. You know, tons and tons of like a tens flying around just, 
fucking yeah, lacing the place up, str- running strafing runs, just like blowing these things to fucking pieces. Like, no, no, let's put let's let's make some clunky, shitty armor and put men in it, and you know, <laughs> reel them down out of VTOLs into the like right onto a hot battlefield, and you know, just watch them all get waste up immediately. If a sword will kill one, you'd think that a couple of bunker buster bombs would sort them out in fucking no time. Yeah. They clearly can't fly. There's no airborne element to the creatures. So mm. why would you have a Normandy style invasion where everybody's just going to get red shirted, man? I mean, it's just dumb. Well, that's the flip side, I think. We're like, I think I'm forgiving of the holes in this because it's entertaining. And I think the decisions were were script based, not world building based, where hey, let's do a Normandy invasion with futuristic weapons. That sounds like it'll be a cool on the screen. And hey, let's do robot suits, but we can't do like full mechs because it'll be too expensive. So we'll just do these weird assist suits and then our actors won't have their faces covered. And the actors won't do it because they won't, we won't see their faces. Yeah. (laughs) That's what I'm seeing. (laughs) You can see all those decisions. Mm, mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I could see that too, but you know what? And I mean, this is one of those movies that I, I enjoyed it so much. It's like, it's all forgivable. I mean, we can sit here and debate it and pick that little bit apart. I, I, I think it's stupid, but you take it up, take it away and you don't really have the movie anymore. That's it. You know, I guess I'd rather have the movie. Yeah. Agree. Yeah, I totally agree. So, so, so it might've been a script decision, you know, based on like a reality of filming something decision, you know, which I totally get too. So, I mean, this sort of thing happens all the time. It's like, you can only do so much with written material man you know it's like you can't you cannot turn everything into a movie you know or or make it totally plausible yeah. so it's like you know or, or have the money to like make full mech suits for every single soldier so it's like you know and do like the tony stark iron man in in suit style close-ups and stuff you know <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely man I mean, there's. It was no secret about the uh, the D Day throwback because it was released on fucking D Day, and they did a Normandy invasion sequence. Like they were really going for that, obviously. So I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just like inspired by like the opening fucking battle scene. The first thirty seconds is. I mean, you could almost fucking composite it with the uh, shaving Ryan's privates, and it would be the same goddamn thing. You know, it was pretty much the same thing. <laughs> Shaving Ryan's privates. Never heard that? Come on, you've heard that before. I I probably have, but the way you nonchalantly threw it into (laughs) your stream of uh, verbiage there without uh, missing a beat was very, very funny. I'm sorry, you're welcome. I'll buy it. I buy it. I buy the implausibility and I'm okay with it. Yeah. Mm. Maybe, Maybe just to close this out. The thing I think I like the most, even though it's not done well, is I have a, such a soft spot for Space Marines. And I realize that this isn't technically Space Marines because they're on their own planet. But the whole dropping mm. Space Marines from craft kind of thing, like I just have such a soft spot for that in the sci-fi, you know, trope universe. And I just enjoyed seeing it, even if it was kind of weird fucking mech suit, fucking futuristic forklift suits or whatever the fuck they are, you know, so... Oh, dude, they were totally like the forklift suits from Aliens. Yeah, definitely. So I'm okay with it. And I totally agree with both of you that like it's forgivable, even though it's obvious that it's kind of shitty. But the Space Marine thing, I think, just tips it over the edge for me. And I'm like, yep, I'm on board. Let's hang a bunch of weird forklifts from cables. Totally plausible. Let's do it. Mm. Mm. Right. No, it's uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I mean, my Space Marines is sort of limited to aliens, I guess, but I definitely dug the Colonial Marines and aliens for sure. And this had a little bit of a bent like that, you know. No, it's it's part aliens. It's part um, Starship Troopers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm, oh, damn it. Yes. Especially the book. The book. Which book? Starship? Starship Troopers. I got to read that. Damn dude, thing, it's one man. of my favorites all time, dude. It's so good. It's so short, but so good. Wow. I know the movie's nothing like it, but I love the movie still. I have watched it in the last six months. It's funny, though, because if you like I've held back on watching the Starship Troopers movie because of how comedic it was and how much I love the book. And we talked about doing a show on it. So I watched it and it actually is really close to the book. If you just delete all the comedy that it is the book, like it's just more serious. You know, so it's pretty close. Hmm. 
Hmm. I like that, man. Well, I mean, it's Verhoeven, you know? It's, yeah, it it's is. Got he that, he like, makes it he makes it into something. Social cool. commentary, satire kind of, mm. you know, thing going on. Mm-hmm. Would you like to know more? I'll take a uh, I'll take a pre-show death here because I missed the Whoa. so goddamn obvious this is kind of like a video game nature of this movie. I don't know how I missed it. Oh, absolutely. But I just never picked up on the whole video gaminess, like the Halo, gotta beat a level, play the same thing over and over again until you get good thing, and it's just like beat you over the head obvious, but I never picked up on it. And it's death worthy. You're talking about Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, right. It's like Yeah. It's like a game save. Like yeah, yeah. When he keeps waking up on the duffel bags, that's like the, the that's the save point, point yeah. from the game that he keeps going back to every time he dies. And he gets better at the game. You know, he gets better at playing. Yeah, it's it's that last point. He took a bad a bad save, and uh, like you know, there's no checkpoints to get to. Like he just has to get all the way to the end of the game at that point, and he's kind of mm. fucked. Yep. Well, I never <laughs> thought about this movie like that before. What what was that death, Chad? Well, you can take the death too cuz it's it's the video game death. It's the Halo, it's the Halo death. I don't know. It's like so unbelievably obvious, but I never thought about it. Well, there it is. There it is. I think it made me a little <laughs> wistful for Halo. I just have such a soft spot for the original Halo and the first couple of games. Same. Especially for Man Geek Sundays, dude. I mean, oh, come on. Yeah, that was, those were good. Mm, Man Geek Sundays. The glory years. True multiplayer. Back-to-back TVs. Using exploits and making your friends cry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Back when Kev was Jarhigo. Yeah, original continuity Jarhigo. That's right. That's a, good, that's a good bit of lore that nobody knows on the show. I don't, don't know if we've ever touched on the fact that you were... I always called you Jarhigo. That was, yeah, that was, I think, where the confusion came in. Well, you were, I think you were calling me Jarhigo, and I was calling Ben Jarhigo. And then it was like, you know, we got in the room, and it was like, hey, your peanut butter got my chocolate, you know, like that kind of moment. And then it was like, what do we do? What was your your call (laughs) sign in Man Geek, Benny? I can't remember. Uh, It was Narkill. Narkill, that's right. I was Was Rick James. Was mine Jarhigo? I had purple armor, and I was Rick James. Well, who was, what was mine? I don't remember. You were Jarhigo. I, I, I think you. I think oh, you took right. Jarhigo. Yeah, yeah, I did try Jarhigo. That's right. Yeah, we had that that moment with the uh, fan films, like, and having a good laugh about that. And then you're like, oh, Jarhigo. I wish I could find that damn fan film we saw that day, dude. <laughs> Which one? That spawned the entire thing. No, it was this one video. Like Ben and I found it, or Ben found it, and I was over at his place, and he was. We were watching it. And it was just really bad i mean it wasn't well whatever the names were definitely bad and right, ben started right. making fun of them and that's where the whole jarhigo thing was born oh of like dumb that. star wars names yeah and i thought it was so yeah. damn funny dude i was laughing so hard and then i just was like dude i started calling him jarhigo that just re- literally came of it like <clears throat> i think i had showed you that like way of the saber video where it's yep. like two dudes yes. doing like Two martial artists like doing like a, you know, like a saber fight in the forest or whatever, where they added in the effects afterwards. And then like you were looking at the sidebar on YouTube and you're like, dude, bro, what are, what are all the rest of these things? And I was like, no, man, you don't want to watch that shit, man. It's like, <laughs> yeah, Jar Higo. What do we do it. when the dark saber comes to get us? You know, like, like <laughs> well, I thought you're doing it in the Kermit the Frog voice right yeah. now. Okay. Oh, my God. You have to do a Kermit as a Jedi video now. No man, that's too good. I've I'm part of a couple of like subreddits for like sci-fi books and shit, just like little little ones that surface some good books from time to time. And um, maybe you guys have seen this before, but often there's somebody who's like, "Hey, can you guys help me find this book? It's about a guy that's on a planet and he has black shoes." And then once like the first comments, always like, "Oh, that's blah 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 by blah," and the other guy's like, "Holy fuck, I've been waiting for twenty years to find this book." <laughs> I feel like you could jump on a Star Wars Reddit and just say three words about the video in question, and they'd be like, "Yes, that's a video two seven two from fan art." To, you know what I mean? Like, you should totally try that. Yeah, but there it, there is no such video. Like, I think we ended up watching some of those, but like, you know, there it, it was like going from Way of the Saber, where it's like just like this ridiculous, you know, like choreographed martial arts fight. Mm. To you know, nerds like warping on camera, basically. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, my my recollection, Ben, to be fair, was a little bit different. I feel like we did. I specifically remember watching one of those crappy videos, and I remember 
one of the guys saying like, oh, Lord Kalival, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, my God, that's terrible. And I, my memory yes. is that that's when you were like, <laughs> Jarhigo. <laughs> they didn't say Jarhigo. We didn't get Jarhigo from the video, though. I guess it's fun. No, you Fire made that up. That yeah. was your yeah. own thing. It's the, one of the most perfect Star Wars names, dude. It is. <laughs> yeah. It's totally Star Wars. Yeah. It's great. Maybe we should just name this episode the Nostalgia episode. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Trey sakes. All right. Speaking of nostalgia, let's talk Pax Team for a minute here. Hey. Absolutely. Uh,. Okay, yeah, let's talk Paxton, man. Because um, I really enjoyed like Tom Cruise and his weaselly phase in the beginning of this movie. He did a great job with it. And Paxton just did such an amazing job of like the first time he delivers all the lines. He's the badass, you know, you know, Arnie Army or whatever his name is from fucking Full Metal Jacket. What's his name? Science Hill, Kentucky. Why is it called Science <laughs> Hill? I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> the um he just does a, such a great job of delivering all those lines and then he does an even better job of like being confused when Tom Cruise fucks with him throughout like the next 10 sequences. He just it just fuck me the guy does an amazing job. Like he is just phenomenal. And it's such a bit part. It is a bit part. You're right. And it's a really great one too, man. I I agree with everything you just said. He he really dialed it in nicely. But that's the that's really just showcases his skill as a performer you know mm. yeah it's a it's a major bit part it is it is a major bit part <laughs> there are lots of bits part bit parts that was a one of the bigger ones for sure yeah definitely but it's really packed in that just kind of brings that level of thunder and and you know steals the show just with his with his pure awesomeness yeah crack my ass I was watching a um a making of of um Groundhog Day last week. And it's super obvious, but like I didn't put two and two together that they would just do multiple takes. So they they'd set the setup or whatever the shot up and they would do all of the takes for all of the different days at once. Sure. Which it's like so obvious when you think about it from a technical standpoint, like why would you film the whole movie and then film it again and and again and again like you would just do one take after another with the different progression of the characters throughout and thinking about them doing that here it's just it would have been it would have been amazing to be on set watching you know the Paxton crews kind of back and forth with each take just having a totally different feel and more or less confusion or whatever it's just yeah I'm saying the same thing again but it was just fucking great yeah no doubt dude I never thought about that about Groundhog Day. Now, there's a movie I've seen like literally a hundred times. It's a good one, man. Oh, so good. So anyway, yeah, Paxton uh, really dialed it in in this one. I don't really have much else to say there. Do we need to do a uh, a little uh, steak and mustache corner here and, and do some assessment? Oof. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Even though I have since uh, try, tried trying desperately to mimic the haircut that you had, Ben, I landed on something else, but it's short hair and I have no mustache. So, whoa, let's, hey. let's, yeah, let's talk mustaches, baby. I'm growing the mustache back and now, now I look like a cop. So, aside from the scientist dude, who is the mustache in this? I'm taking a death probably. No, you you are. Paxton had a mustache in this, dude. Did he? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm definitely taking a death then. You're not taking it. It's being given. It's done. <laughs> it <is> done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking another death right now to look it up. Edge of Tomorrow. I need to see this thing. Yeah. So, it's a, you oh, know, yeah. It's, a, it's like a regulation mustache. It's a little, you know, military issue mustache. Not too, over, the, you know, above the lip. You guys got to watch that... Uh, that um, David Simon follow up to the wire, the Iraq War miniseries was Generation Kill. There's like a whole mustache thing in that, where this fucking <laughs> this like I don't know if he's like a master sergeant or something, just goes around screaming at everybody because regulations are that you can't have the mustache go outside the boundaries of the corners of your mouth. And then he just runs around being like, "Police yeah. that mustache!" <laughs> I, I have seen that. It's yeah. fucking great, Oof. dude. This is totally a regulation mustache by Paxton. I love it. Yeah, and he rocks it, man. So does the fact that it's regulation mean that you're like more forgiving of the quality of the stash here in terms of the rating of stashes? Well, 
I, I respect the fact that, you know, it's, uh, it's realistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a realistic, uh, you know, military mustache portrayal. Yeah. There's so. no caterpillar mustaches in the military, at least not since, uh, the world war one biplane barons it's within the, within the confines of the mouth. It's not over the lip. It's, you know, yeah. it's not very big, but it's neat. And, uh, it, it suits Paxton. I think he, he looks quite, uh, it's quite fetching. Yeah, that with the hat, you know, like the military hat. He he looks very uh, sergeant from he looks very sergeant from Kentucky esque. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was particularly struck by the the scientist dudes. What I thought was a sweet stash, I thought it was like mutton chops that turn into a stash with a shaved chin. But it turns out he just has a really patchy facial hair thing going on because it's more beardish. Yeah. But it was beardish, yeah. Yeah, it was beard esque, no doubt. That's definitely not stash territory for sure. Uh, who else had a stash in this? Was it just Paxton? I, think I mean, was, that's yeah, enough. I think it was. It was. I mean, that's really all I was coming. I mean, it was just an extension of uh, talking about the mighty Bill Paxton. To be fair, it was probably in his contract that nobody else was allowed to have a mustache. So, I- shave your mustache now. <laughs> you must shave your mustache now. <laughs> There's some type four amphibious fuel in that fuel drum. Shave your mustache now. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's so stupid. It's so stupid and it never seems to get old. Uh, oh, God, I love it. Yeah, I guess I'll just add, I, I don't know if I really chimed in when uh, we we're talking about the fact that, uh, you know, getting some warm and fuzzies for seeing bill paxton um which i absolutely did but you know it was a little extra warm and fuzzy because you know he had a, he had a pretty rocking military regulation mustache <laughs> military mustache. issue mustache yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm with you benny steak and mustaches this and this concludes steak and mustaches Steak and mustaches. Did Brendan Gleeson have a bit of facial hair? I don't think he did. He did not. And I thought of that a minute ago. He didn't. I wish he did. He was great in this, man. If you can hit a steak, you can hit a mustache. (laughs) If you can hit a steak, you can throw a child off a temple roof. (laughs) (laughs) I like that Rita Vertasky. I like that it wasn't a Groundhog Day love story. So it's not trying to get Andy McDowell slash Emily Blunt to fall in love with you. It's trying to save the world while Emily Blunt falls in love with you. Like it's like a, a I side love how car. Chad's trying to talk about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to put this one forward, guys. We don't do that on this podcast anymore. Are you kidding me? <laughs> really good try. I'll bite. Um, yeah, I agree with that. That was another point that uh, I, I spent a little bit of time thinking about. Like it was. It was a well done um, and and plausible in the same way that Groundhog Day did it. You know what I mean? But I, I really like the way that they played it in this one. I think it worked well. It was subtle enough. There wasn't too much of it, you know. And there was a really yeah. great human element to it with a good good amount of vulnerability. You know, like she was clearly, you know, kind of a little beat up from you know, losing her partner or her husband or lover or whatever it was. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, she was very kind of uh, withdrawn or very private. And, uh, you know, him just kind of reliving the days and observing her and going through the motions of these different things. Like it's, it's, it's almost like an inevitability that you're going to start to develop some kind of, you know, fondness or attachment or whatever so and and i really thought the execution of it was great you know they didn't cram it down your throat or make it into some stupid thing like you know the two of them driving off in the woods like in blade runner or whatever (laughs) i was just so glad that didn't happen because it would have just ruined what was a really good movie unicorns yeah (laughs) (laughs) totally um it was absolutely there you know there, there, there was a Groundhog Day romance thing there, but it was wisely not the focus. It was a sort yeah. of like a side effect. Yeah, totally. It was, and it was, you know, again, like really well done. And like the the 
her grabbing him at the end and planting that kiss on him, I was like, you know, that's a really great way to kind of. <clears throat> which, which, by the way, was apparently an ad lib by uh, Emily Blunt. No shit, that's awesome. He did have a bit of a surprised look there. She was like, "I finally get to kiss Tom Cruise." That's a pretty good Emily Blunt, dude. Nice work. Yeah, I know. I practiced <laughs> it for <laughs> all week. <laughs> I like the um. I like the fact that, like you said a second ago, like it was inevitable that they were going to get a thing, or he was going to get a thing for her, and it, it's totally plausible in the sense that. A lot of times, you if you spend a lot of time with somebody, you end up kind of getting really close. And I, I've seen a lot of relationships come out of that type of thing where it's just like one of the two of the people are really into the other one and the other one maybe is just kind of like whatever. But you spend a bunch of time together and it ends up kind of becoming a thing or even if it's just becoming a friendship. And it's so one-sided in this thing. You know, he's he's hanging out with her every day. Whereas she just is just like one day at a time, kind of no idea. And I like how like just cold and hard she is. <laughs> like she'll just be like, all right, because she's in on it, unlike Andy McDowell. So she's like, all right, I'm just going to pull out my fucking side arm and blast your head off. You know, <laughs> I just I love how much she's just willing to do that. And he's like, no, 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 let's just have a cup of coffee first. I'm fine. I'm fine. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I forgot about that, actually. I'm glad you brought that up because that was a that was another key key element in this that was different was him either forcing his own death or you know her killing him over and over it's also totally another video game callback because if you're in the midst of something like that where like you're just overwhelmed and like you know you don't have the resources yeah. to finish like you know whatever level um, you're on you're like fuck it i'll just like let myself die and start over again because like i'm not gonna waste my time trying to keep going totally anymore. totally <laughs> yeah yeah no that's a good point yeah. man that's a really good point and to your point, Kev, the kiss at the end, like the only reason it's plausible at all, in my view, is one, Tom Cruise is at the pinnacle of his abilities as a as a super soldier. And so she, throughout the course of that particular day, like they finally get to the place, they get the thing from uh, Gleason, and then they end up in the hospital. He's like, I'm out. You know, I don't, I no longer have the ability to reset the day. And then from then on, He's like out fucking on the wing with the dual cannon thing while they're flying through the water. Like he's just going for it like she goes for it. And I think there's a respect, a mutual respect there. And then the only reason in my mind that that she plants the kiss and it's plausible is because she knows she's going to die. And like there is no resetting the day. So she's just like, fuck it. You know, like this guy's like the other guy or like he'd do anything and he's going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to plant the kiss on him. And I, I'm totally down with that. Like it's the only way that that's yeah. plausible. She as much says, I wish I had a, a, you know, chance to know you better, essentially. Yeah. Which was cool. I really dug that, man. It was really a respectful way to do it. And I also think that um, kind of, you know, springboarding off what you said, Chad, like it's it's another like, okay, so I know I'm going to die. This is like, I, I want to do like something that's so utterly and completely human is like one of the last things I do. Sure. Like yeah. To, to be close to somebody and to kiss somebody, you know, and yeah, really well done, man. You know, it's like a lot of these things you wouldn't expect from this movie. This movie is really, this is why I think this movie is great. It's got a lot of, you know, interesting elements, some that are mm. just kind of strange, you know, that like we already talked about that it's like, oh yeah, it doesn't really work, you know, or it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's for, you still forgive it because there's so much going on that's so cool in this movie, like this stuff that we're talking about, you mm. know. Yeah. The, the way they portrayed that and not cramming it down your throat. Like there's so many movies that I wish they handled like the human connection or the romance or whatever like this, you know, mm -hmm. and they just don't. And it just ends up making the movie so stupid. So kudos. I don't want to uh, completely skip over. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we're just here now because the movie is really like, you know, literally <laughs> wash, rinse, repeat. I love how we just jumped to the end. We could jump back <laughs> if like, we need to. We were like, Normandy, okay, the kiss is great. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I really like about the movie is on their, like, final run, they get, like, the band together, you know? Um, yes. I thought it was cool yes. that they, like, they were able to bring in, like, all the people from his, like, from J Troop or whatever. Yes. Um, <laughs> F Troop. <to> assist. <laughs> goof, goof Troop. I, I liked that about it. I thought I thought that was cool. Because, other, you know, like, it's like, yeah, like, they kind of spent some time on, like, the people in that 
like division and it was i thought it was great that they like brought everybody in for the sort of you know grand finale yeah and it gave them all a chance to be heroic as well show that they had some chops yeah yeah you know the other thing too that was cool about it was that they weren't like um which i really liked a lot you know, usually in a movie like that, when you see it's like, you know, okay, we got to get a ragtag group of guys that are so crazy to go in here and, you know, I don't care about death and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like it's so played. But these guys aren't like that. You know what I mean? And a couple things that are cool about it is is one of them is that, that they're, they're sort of A, reluctant, and B, they're not like, you know, the typical ultimate team, you know. It's like a police academy. Which I really movie. like. Kind, well, I wouldn't go that far, but like, you know, it's, they're kind of like, um, knuckleheads, the, the people that, well, yeah, but the people they could most easily convince to do it, you know, that weren't necessarily like, you know, the best of the best of the best. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the second time you've gone there. I love it. I mean, it's still, guess what? Still nobody cares but me. <laughs> It's literally just the people that he had the intel on that he could convince, like that something's up, you know. Right, but the, but my second my second point is that that it's 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 interesting because it kind of ties in with what we were just talking about about human connection. Like he doesn't really know these people at all, right? But th- by virtue of being, you know, experiencing that short amount of time with them so many times, he's able to glean that much information and throw it back at them to the point that they gen well most of them anyway sort of genuinely trust him enough to go with him you know and there's just an interesting connection there you know what i mean so it's like they're they're really taking a leap of faith you know what i mean i think i think one of them uh shit their pants right yeah i think so <laughs> the russian dude that was quiet <laughs> I feel like I feel like uh, I kind of don't want to say this because I don't want to ruin the moment, but I f- I kind of had a gripe a Kev moment about this particular choice because it's so obvious that like in a non movie setting they would not have gone and convinced these particular J Squad guys and girls because they would have just gone to Rita's crew, all the dudes that were all geared up. They would have been like, "Hey, Rita's crew, we're gonna go and do this," and they would have been like, "Cool." Let's do it. But from a from a storytelling perspective and the connection perspective, it makes so much more sense to to close that loop and have those yeah. those misfits on J Squad come good and go and save the day and die heroically. And so I'm like, I'm s i am I think it's a good example of what we talked about earlier of the, the the story has holes in it, but I'm willing to paper over them because the execution was so enjoyable. And I think having mm. that connection with J-Squad here and having them have their heroic moment was very enjoyable. I'm not sure I 100% agree there, though, because there's not much. We don't know anything about Rita's crew. That's true. Like, there's a, a little bit of implication that, like, you know, these are people that have been together or whatever, but she never says a fucking word about them. Like... They never get in Tom Cruise's way when he's trying to approach her. They don't. Mm, it's true. I mean, you know, whatever. Um, one one would one would presume that like these are like handpicked people, you know. But but she clearly hasn't shared any of this with any of them. No, but she is leadership. Like she would just be like, "Crew, we're going here," and they'd be like, "Yeah, cool." Right. But yes, I know what you're saying. True, but. Well, I gotta, I'm going to poke a hole in my own thing, too, because, like, I was trying to kind of say what you were saying, Chad. It was that, like, you know, he got to develop the connection with him because of, you know, that sort of limited amount of information, but doing it so many times. But then I, I totally forgot that he says, like, you know, you're not going to follow me. You're going to follow her. Then she walks out of the shadows, and they're like, oh, my God, it's you, full metal bitch. Yeah. But it works. Like, he gets them halfway there. Well, I think it was a little bit of both, man. You know? Yeah, he exactly. He gets them halfway there. She gets them the rest of the way, the way, yeah. the way there. The whole thing, in my mind, like, all of what you guys were just saying about it's nice that Chase squad gets involved, the payoff is when he comes back and wakes up in the helicopter in the last two minutes of the movie and 
sees them jogging by and they're alive again and that like little smile he gets and wistfulness that he's you know that they're alive again like that's the payoff for me where you're just like oh that's so cute i love that yeah yeah that was cool too like it was a it was a really good ending because we didn't thank god get like some oh rita now we can get to know each other Duh. let me go throw up everywhere like <laughs> it was just it was so much better that it was just like wake up and then see the guys jogging by and it's like you know sly smile and just like cut to credits perfect perfect way to end the story he sells that smile man i know you said it was a punchable smile but he's just like so happy she's not dead that he doesn't give a fuck. I, I think there's a distinction there, though. It's it's a punchable smile in certain situations. You know what I mean? In other situations, it's not. You know, and I think that that's like a purely, you know, it's like when Cruz is like being Cruz and hamming it up, and it's like a punchable smile. But then there's the other times when he's like, it's legit and it's good. I think it's just that Tom Cruise cheese dick smile that uh, he does all the time. And I, I like to imagine that that she like roundhouse kicked him in the jaw and like <laughs> maybe broke it. And then he was like laughing, you know, and he was just like, what the fuck? You know? Yeah. She's so salty in those opening, like the first time that he meets her kind of scenes. So yeah, I could totally buy that. I saw a cool, uh, a kind of a cool explanation on the reddits about the ending that I didn't, I don't think I picked up on, but please enlighten me. It was like, um, playing, it was toying with the idea of like, Tom Cruise being the alpha when he dies in the opening, he becomes one of the alphas that is connected to the Omega, all that kind of shit. And the point with which he dies in the opening sequence, he goes back to the previous time he was conscious. So he goes back to the duffel bag scene because it's like, for whatever reason, the previous like awakening into consciousness is the moment that it resets to it doesn't reset to like a time it resets to him waking up and you go through the whole movie of him waking up on the duffel bag and then the explanation for him waking up in the helicopter is because they saved the day he doesn't end up getting um sent to the front by gleason and therefore doesn't get tasered and his previous conscious moment is waking up on the helicopter and so that's why it jumps back to there which i thought was kind of an interesting I don't know. An interesting way to explain why it jumps back to that point. I had a, a little bit of a gripe of Kev with the uh, him going back to the point of waking up on the he- helicopter. Just insofar as like, why did he wake up on the helicopter and not on the duffel bags? Yeah, yeah. Um, whatever. I'll, I'll, but do you buy that that it, that the duffel bags no longer a thing because they solved the time conundrum bullshit or whatever? Or? Sh- sure, I guess. Yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it's, it. It's an explanation. I'll buy it. I suppose it's it's one of the examples of the time not branching multi universe thing not being a thing. You know, like if time isn't branching and they're not doing the multiverse bullshit, then then by killing the Omega, none of it ever happened. None of it ever happened. Yeah, one might presume that it would go further back even than that, but yeah, maybe. I guess it would go back to it would reset to whenever they started using the the. Uh, for lack of a better term time shenanigans the spaghetti <laughs> monsters you know so yeah may- maybe they didn't really start using the time shenanigans until after the the whole fiasco with the the general like trying to conscript him onto the front lines and all that so hey farber what's the name of that bar that uh, you like to go to you know the Big one with all the- <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> uh. place a little shit on the walls with all the stupid shit shenanigans <laughs> thank you for that sorry Kev that one went over your head it's a super troopers reference <laughs> super troopers joke sorry no 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 it didn't actually is it what are you talking is it was there a movie uh, a restaurant or a bar named shenanigans yeah yeah and they take the piss out of it well I'm sorry I derailed your point Betty <laughs> what, what, what's the time shenanigans can we go back to that i actually was curious what you had to say there. i think i completed my uh my point there okay actually <laughs> yeah at least at least you you were uh okay with the uh super troopers cul de sac there i guess i guess i was saying like you know that perhaps that that moment where like the the aliens hadn't started employing their time shenanigans until like after he had gotten off the helicopter or, or oh whatever, yeah you know, and, like before he got conscripted or whatever and that was the moment that like you know the timeline was set to before all that shit started to happen, I guess. Yeah. But, um, 
It makes I'm, sense. I'm glad I chose Time Shenanigans. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I, I want to re- I want to rename the movie Time Shenanigans. Actually, we should call this episode Time Shenanigans. Time Shenanigans. <laughs> Time Shenanigans. All right. Probably won't make much sense based on what we're talking about until the very end, but okay. <laughs> I'm down. I think I think before we get to Nuggets Death's ratings, I think we should uh, talk about the real star of this movie, Emily Blunt. She was fucking so badass in this movie. She was awesome. I mean, like, you know, the the opening with her, like, just, you know, doing the plank hold with one arm on the in the middle of the drone workout room was sick, you know? <laughs> so good. I, I kind of wanted to shoot myself by the fourth time I'd seen that. But, um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Come on. I love how coldly she just takes his battery in that one early scene. She's just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, that was pretty damn cold. What are you ejecting about? Uh, something, uh, well, when you started talking about Tom Cruise's smile, the only thing I could think of was Ben Stiller being Tom Cruise. <laughs> Tom Cruise's stunt yes. double. That's <laughs> so good, dude. I love that shit. It's so yeah, good. I had to share it. I mean, whatever. We've all probably seen it, but. I don't know if I've ever seen that. That's good stuff. Are you watching it now? No, I'm not watching it. Sorry. <laughs> Focus Trinity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so great early on and such a great showcase of her character's ability to not give a fuck that she just like he saves her life and then he takes one to the chest and she just like pops his battery out. And it's like, all right, see you, dude. She doesn't even say anything. She just fucking walks off. It's fucking great, man. Such a badass character. No, it is. Yeah, she's very singular of motive through the whole thing. And understandably so, because, you know, so is Tom Cruise. They've both gone through the same thing. And hard as nails, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you just got to do what <laughs> needs to be done, regardless of anything that you may or may not care about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought she was really good. Between this and Looper, man, I've got I definitely got a, a lot of sci-fi love for her. She did a good job. In Looper? Who is she in Looper? She was uh, the farmhouse mother of the uh, the kid that goes oh, nuts. Oh, shit. You're right. Yes. Oh, God, dude. That's a death. That's a death, man. It's a looper death. <laughs> it's looper death, bro. Looper death, bro. Well, that's it. I just wanted to chime in with uh, some Emily Blunt love before Nugget Seth's ratings. Yeah, for sure. This is probably the thing I would most associate her with. Um, mm. uh, well, there's also The Devil Wears Prada, where she was pretty damn good in that. It's actually a really good movie. Yeah, it's pretty good. I just don't really revisit those kind of movies very often. I don't either. I've only seen it once. I just remembered how great she was in it. I haven't seen it. I followed that up with Beaches. (laughs) (laughs) You are the wind beneath my wings. You know what else she was really good in, man, is Sicario, dude. That was great. Oh, dude, that that might be her best. What if Bette Midler was in this movie? (laughs) What if I, Bette Midler played the full metal bitch? What if Belt and Bette Midler was in Sicario? I would watch dude? that. Both. I would love a Bette Midler giant helicopter blade sword. That'd be so good. That'd be awesome. It'd be so un, you know, just like not uh like unlikely, you know, that it would it would be believable. I buy it. <laughs> I love that idea. That's perfect. That's an everybody dies cinematic universe official statement. Bette Midler. As the full metal bitch. In our universe, it is starring Bette Midler. <laughs> but would it still be Tom Cruise? Tom Cruise. Dude. It, Danny me, DeVito. It's, yes. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> it's like Tom Cruise. Everybody's getting their ass kicked on the beach. Bette Midler comes in like full on, man. Like just f- skills bouncing around, kicking ass, no armor whatsoever, wearing like something she'd wear in one of those Broadway shows. And then she grabs Tom Cruise and he goes, you are the wind beneath my wings. And they break out into a musical montage. Exactly. Or whatever. And there's like a whole bunch of uh, mechs on the beach. Edge of Tomorrow, the musical starring Bette Midler, (laughs) Danny DeVito. I do like the idea of like a Normandy beach invasion with a bunch of mechs like doing the tap dance, Broadway dance moves all together. That'd be pretty Mm, good. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) There you go. Dude. (laughs) So long and thanks for all the fish. (laughs) (laughs) 
Are there any um, are there any bits and bobs of things that we didn't cover? Maybe this is the chance to to dip back to scenes that were good. Yeah, let's do bits and bobs. Um, well, I'll I'll start it off by just saying that um, I I really dug the creature design. I oh, thought totally. It was, uh, I mean, I know like you guys were making fun of them before, and 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 rightly so. But uh, at the same time, uh, they were. I, I really liked the entire idea and the premise of just like a meteor. You know, kind of, kind of like a very natural um, kind of occurrence, but you know, like, like things happen in nature all the time, right here on the planet. But like, if you kind of zoom out and expand that to like the entirety of a galaxy, you know, like a meteor hitting a planet is a very natural thing. So I, I really dug that idea of them traveling like that, you know, and then the, the design of the creatures themselves was, was really good and really well thought out. You know what I mean? And, um, I don't know. I just, I just dug it. It it was really interesting. There was a, um, there was a cool YouTube video about the creature creation and how they couldn't animate them one by one, the tentacles. So they ended up like creating a, programmatic way to do it which is pretty cool so it was all just like telling the creature to do this do that and placing the foot here and there but all of the crazy weird maneuvers would be programmatic instead of animated which was which was a clever way to get it done would you say that perhaps they came up with an algorithm oh Ah, whoa the flying spaghetti monster algorithm i love it god how does that how does that never happen until now well it just did brah Bra. Well, I just did. So set your face to stun. Did he just call me a piece of underwear? <laughs> yeah, bra. Yeah, the creatures were sick. I actually, I don't have any yeah. shit talk about the creatures. I really liked them. I even liked the uh, the kind of uh, fun town auto scream of the alpha, just being like, "Oh, with the fucking heat coming out of its mouth," kind of thing. Yes, mm. total fun town. It would have been so great if, like, when he finally went down to, like, the in the thing in the dam where he thought the Omega was and, like, that Alpha showed up and he was like, get your fucking jackpot. <laughs> it's a stretch, but totally. I had forgotten the detail of the creature design and then enjoyed seeing it. Like, I like the color, like, the kind of heat coloring inside of them. And there's, like, one scene in particular early on where, like, one of the orange grunt things is kind of, like, starts fucking voguing or something and like the you know do you know the scene i'm talking about where like the the tentacles just like flash out really far real quick Mm. am i dying here yes like pulses like yeah it was super cool yeah i kind of don't feel like we were shit talking them but yeah the uh like the the lesser ones seemed more like like just tumbleweeds yeah like they were just kind of like blobs of of like action tasmanian devils which is which is a, a very unique thing i haven't seen that before and it was it was cool mm. and i like that they were really fast you know like they were threatening as in they could just pop out of anywhere and you know have their way with you as it were i agree I, they could do everything except fly you know what i mean it was like they could burrow under the yeah. sand the water like yeah and it totally it totally backs up your your point benny of how uh slow the mechs were yeah the the alphas seem to be a little more like uh, anthropomorphic though. They were a little more like how metaphor so, sort of. I had noticed a few times like they seemed to like whereas like the little ones seem to just sort of like have like a orange like light in the middle of like a flickering mass of tentacles. Whereas the uh, the the alphas seemed more like they had like a like a body shape form. With, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's some parts where you could see them like climbing or like, you know, reaching out or doing things and they looked, you know, I mean, I guess one thing I didn't understand about them is why they were called uh, uh, mimics. I didn't get that either. Like, it's not like, you know, somebody went to pick up a coffee cup and it like, like you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lashed out at, the, at them with uh, tentacles and sucked them in, or something. You know, like that never happened. Like they seem to be good at like hiding. I guess. I guess. But whenever they came out, it wasn't like they were. You know, like for instance, um, when they come up on the like the motor lot and she steals the the minivan with the caravan attached to it. Like there's one hiding in there that pops out afterwards, but it wasn't like it was like disguised as the the camper you know like it wasn't like it it took the form of a camper and then like you know mm-hmm. 
tried to get them as they were driving away. I just happened to be hiding in there. So I didn't, you know, the mimic thing kind of. Now that you bring that up, I think I'm mad and I don't like this movie anymore. I never considered the names being not like it makes no sense. But yeah, it's, it's almost like they 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 did away with it or something. Yeah, They're exactly. Like, no, it's close enough. Whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just a name. Yeah. I mean, the name's kind of <laughs> cool, but it doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm a little lost there. Maybe there's uh, like a, a Reddit thread that people have. <laughs> That'll that, explain it. Totally. That like makes you go like, huh, all right, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in uh another another bitter bob i liked the uh the first <laughs> the first time he tried to get away from the squad doing push-ups and got run over by the car <laughs> pax is just like what are you thinking yeah that was yeah. good too. i like that too i was like that's funny it's in super a morbid funny. kind of way there's a whole speaking of reddit there's a whole fucking side thread that that proves it's a multiverse theory because he would have been dead and the fact that they talked after he was dead and then other people are like no he was still alive he isn't it's just like okay guys take a deep breath right drink some of your mountain dew easy chill the fuck out he hadn't quite died yet no drink some more of your extreme mountain dew of your sunny d in the fridge that kev's in drink some more of your game fuel (laughs) you got any uh bobs yeah i guess my bobs would revolve around uh one, um, Bill Paxton, mm. and two, just the whole uh, sort of video game scenario where you're like, you know, it's a checkpoint and you're starting over again and you have to get through to a certain point. I enjoyed that aspect mm. of the story, for sure. Maybe echoing that a little bit, one of the bits I think that really, I think one of the things that really helped me enjoy the movie because it kind of added another layer was at the halfway point where they're in the farmhouse and he's kind of clearly falling in love with Rita, but she doesn't give a fuck about him. And like, he's making her the coffee and Oh wait, you like three sugars and she catches on. He's like, no matter what I do, you never make it out of here. And like, he's done a hundred or a thousand sessions to get her that far. And then he just walks in and then turns around and does the whole thing without her and finds out it was, it's a trap, you know, at the dam. Mm-hmm. I liked that. I liked that, you know, he went down that whole branch and then just went all the way back to the trunk of the tree and went a whole different route. I, I thought that was a cool, that was a cool thing. Well, that he, that he was, yeah, yeah I, I dig that he was, you know, reliving just, I mean, literally hundreds of times and, and figuring out certain things and, you know, talking about, oh, I, I've tried, we've tried this so many times, it never works. We get here and da 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 da, you know, like I, I that adds, a level, uh, an element of, and an, and a, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, not, not the illusion of it, but the, the feeling and sense of time passing, you know what I mean? Like him doing that so many fucking times, like yeah, he, he must've rolled like a thousand times, man. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That. So I, I dig that just kind of adding, adding that onto the heap of what you said. I'm glad I'm glad uh, you guys brought that up because that reminds me of an actual, I guess, bit we would call this where, you know, there's one branch where he just like steals a Triumph motorcycle and drives off and goes to a bar and gets like berated by a bunch of geezers for like being a coward or whatever. Dude, that was great. Like that little part was great because you're like, why wouldn't he, you know, like you would feel like at one point he would just like kind of lose his will and do that. And then, you know, I don't know, whatever, drive off a bridge or something and start over again. But like just that one time where you're like, you know what? I'm not fucking doing this this time. I'm just not going to. <laughs> like I just, I just need to go and sit down and have a fucking beer and like just fucking feel sorry for myself for like five seconds and then, and then I'll just die and start over again. But I, this time I'm not doing it. You know? Yeah, I feel like hmm, my impression of that scene was that he was kind of just like, you know what? I t- I need a break. Like. I'm taking to this time. I'm taking a break. I'm riding to a goddamn bar and having a beer. Like exactly. Yeah. Right on. Which one would presume if you had infinite tries, you would just, you know, (laughs) do that at some point. Like just, uh, I can't do it again. Fucking totally, man. You'd also learn how to play the piano and, you know, sure. Catch the kid in the tree and all that other shit. Right. Yeah, totally. Well, I was just rattling off a list of what Phil (laughs) Bill Murray did. did. Punks at Tony Phil. Maybe, maybe get your skis shined up and grab a stick of juicy fruit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Taste is gonna move you. Exactly, dude. Nuggets test ratings. Yeah. Um, nuggets. I eh, I don't really have anything. I dropped one sort of nugget. The the thing about the armor. 
were really the props. I thought it was going to snipe somebody with the uh, Emily Blunt kiss. Ad-libbing the kiss. Yeah. I like it, though. It's a good nug. It's a good nug right there, bro. Hmm. Okay. I just found one that's pretty neat. (gasps) Wait, wait a minute. Wait a second. What did I do? You ejected to find a goddamn nugget. So what? You're dead. Well, I mean, I think we agree that, like, you know, if you're if you're looking and you're engaged, it's well, not really an ejection. You want to make excuses about your ejections? That's your problem, my friend. What's your nugget? I'm not sure who agreed to what here, but let's hear the <laughs> nugget. No, now I'm not going to tell you because you guys are being mean. <laughs> Mom, you guys are being mean again. <laughs> exactly, dude. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? That's like half the point of the podcast. <laughs> Mom, C-Lab and Jarhigo are not being nice. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Okay, so there's a there's a sequence in the beginning. Emily Blunt punches a young soldier who who says, "Bloody hell, it's the full metal bitch." And the guy that mm. d- says that is her younger brother. Who had a cameo in the film. I thought that was kind of neat, dude. <laughs> I love how you sniped one of my nuggets by like lazily reading IMDb instead of participating <laughs> in your podcast. <laughs> fucking dick no, this makes it all the better That's i'm funny. like sitting here eating brownies watch looking at the internet <laughs> i'm like oh yeah no uh, i'm not even to prepare my nuggets anymore i'm just gonna eject and try to I figure it out at the last minute <laughs> whenever i get bored of my own show i just read the trivia <laughs> i'll inject while i'm uh, i don't know if she punched this guy it might have been like her brother or like her brother-in-law or something i'm not really sure <laughs> <laughs> might have been a sister Subject while I'm pretending to listen to Chad talk about some other nugget. Right. <laughs> my fucking coffee ready yet? I'm so fucking hungover right now. Like, Where's my latte? Oh my God. Why is there no Starbucks here? This place sucks. In the opening montage of all the newscaster shit, um, Tom Cruise's character is making a statement about the upcoming operations, and the room behind him is the NORAD command center from War Games. I think they composited it in, yeah. Get out of here. What do you mean, like, for real? Yeah, They for still real. have the set? I think so, yeah. So they say. Oh, come on. Where in the world? Is Whopper visible? Or? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Ben's like, what's Whopper doing? <laughs> dude, I love Whopper. Totally, dude. A strategic defense computer named after a Burger King hamburger? I mean... What's not to love? Whopper's legendary, dude, and he definitely does not get enough love or play in the various nerdery that happens around the internet, including this show. That's it. You if know, if there's any justice in the world, someday we'll have a Whopper Lego set to. Ooh, that'd be sick. Dedicated fans for. Yeah, here's your Whopper Lego set. It's like twenty black bricks, and you put them all together, and then there's one yellow brick on the side, on the corner. That's the Whopper. Like I, I, was, I was thinking a little more, you know, a little more Technics than that, you know, like a larger set with more pieces, with actual, like, with the bat, with like a 9-volt battery and a little switch so you can turn it on. Yeah, alright, I'm down. Little lights flash around, like, in the, yeah. Little fucking grubby unshowered Matthew Broderick character to go on the top or whatever. Dabney Coleman. You know it. Dabney Coleman. And then you got to have Barry Corbin in there, you know, the general. I love how far down the hole we've gone with this one. Give me a sack (laughs) on the line. (laughs) If you squeeze his head, that's what he says. He's got the cigar, you know. I love it. Give me a sack on the line. Any more nugs? Uh, You want to read any more from us? During your ejection? <laughs> yeah. You conjure any at the last second there, Kev? Or uh... a pregnant two minute pause while you find a good one? No, I'll, I'll spare you and the listeners. Come on, Tars. <clears throat> one, one of my other ideas was a, uh, a Lego, uh, what do they call it? A uh, midwife droid. Oh, bah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. That, that should happen. Me? Yeah, me too. The midwife droid. You mean the Uba droid? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, dude. Uh, no, I'm good, man. Let's, uh, you want to do the deaths? And- I've got one more that the house where they're oh. resting is the same house that Emily Blunt uh, lived in in Looper, which is kind of weird and interesting. What? Yeah, they're both the same building, the sets. How the fuck is that even possible, man? I don't know. They, they look completely different. Maybe one's the back of the house and one's the front of the house. I don't know what to tell you, brah. 
Shit. Well, dude, do more research on your damn nuggets, bitch. Well, full metal, bitch. Or do what I do and to do nothing and then glance at the screen. <laughs> and just read, read them aloud and believe them. That's... All right, all right. Uh, okay, we had... Uh... Oh, Benny didn't have a death. How's that? Really? Or did you? I don't have one and I didn't record one. He's He's still dead from Airborne. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Now that is plausible. I'm mostly dead. I need Miracle Max to, you know, come and use his bellows to breathe some life in me. Miracle Max or go, Miracle man. Mayax? Miracle Mayax. <laughs> um, I don't know. If if Billy Crystal played Mayax, then yes. <laughs> yeah. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a bellows. Have fun storming the castle. Yeah, you go. <laughs> All right, all right. The deaths were as follows. He clearly said to blave, which we all mean, no means to bluff. <laughs> Where he has a gambling debt. Love it. We got to do that one. Boo Blazers. You ready? I'm ready. Helicopter blade sword. That was my first death. Mm. Mm-mm. Well then Chad had a matrix. Mm-hmm. And we each had a halo death. Is there a halo death? Yeah. Was, was yeah. I in there too? Is there such uh, a thing? Well, we each had a halo death. Uh, is there a halo death? Well, there's no, there's not like as a particular death, but we, you had a halo death and then I had a halo death. And it was uh, because we did not, uh, we admitted oh, that we did yeah. not notice the video game nature yeah, yeah, of yeah, the yeah, film. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I got I to gotta jot that down. This is why I write the titles. Fair enough. Let daddy work. And then... We had, uh, let's see, what else is after that? Uh, you had the stash who death because you didn't realize yeah. that Bill Paxton had a stash. It's pretty egregious. Pretty egregious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, I ejected on Tom Cruise, C-R-O-O-Z-E, played by Ben Stiller. And then uh, I forgot that Blunt was in Looper. So that was definitely a death. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's it. That's all I got. Cool. There you go. There you have it. Ratings. This movie gets a A plus. Awesome. A plus all the way. No, seriously though, it's you know, like I said in the opening, I just so enjoyable. I mean, even the nitpicks that we had, like I, I really don't care. Like you said, Chad, I, I'm will <laughs> I'm happy to paper over them. Like they're I don't know, it's just it's a it's a great movie, it's a fun movie. There's like some really good elements and some really great execution at various different points and it's just great man i'm gonna give this movie a nine sweet yeah i don't know why i didn't rate it higher there's really nothing wrong with it nine though that's just that you like other movies more sure yeah i i echo that i um i definitely think the enjoyment factor easily justifies papering over the holes in the plot and story etc etc no doubt yeah and um yeah, I, I did not expect to like this originally. I've watched it, I don't know, easily a dozen times. And mm. um, it ends up at a 6.3, so it's out of the fives. Wow, oh, damn it. Jesus That's a nice Christ. score. It, the company that it keeps, which I think is is a interesting kind of, it's an interesting way to explain the love I have for it, is it's just pipped by Constantine, which I have a real soft spot for, which I think is similarly kind of schlocky and papered over but really I really like that movie flawed and um in the same neighborhood as 28 days later which I think is a it's probably a much better put together movie but it's uh yeah similarly enjoyable so I think it's uh, in good company nice I like it I'm gonna go with uh I'm gonna go with a nine for this one cool um mm, nice and some of my reasoning behind that is because of its flaws and the things that are fun to pick apart about it I think mm. that's that's part of what makes a movie become a classic and something that you talk about, you know, is the the, the little funny details that are, you know, not so well thought out or, or whatever, you know, that uh, end up becoming part of the magic, as it were. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. Nine. I dig it. And also, Bill Paxton, man. Come on. Dude. Oh, there's bonus points there for sure. Mm-hmm. Super cool. Love it. Paxton. So good, man. Anyway, uh, one of my favorite parts of the show is asking C-Lab-Go-Rhythm what we're doing next week. Uh, what are we doing next week? 
I think you will probably be pleased to hear, Kev, that next week we're doing Roadhouse. Ooh, <gasps> I am. That's a, wow, that's exciting. It's a lot of pudding right there, buddy. That is a lot of pudding, dude. That's a epic film. Best Ben Gazzara movie ever. <laughs> Talk about Orange Julius, man. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, well, that, God damn, I, I can't even, I don't have the words, dude. We're going to have some stashes. We're going to have some ass kicking. It's going to be great. Mullets. Yeah, mullets, dude. Holy moly. Um, and, of course, Ben Gazzara. And Marshall Teague. So also, let's not forget our favorite mustachioed hero. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, dude! Wow, that was that's pretty good, dude. He's tough, tough to get his voice. You think you kind of got something going there, buddy? That's hard for me to do anything other than his narration and uh, Lebowski. Mm. But fair enough, dude. You can always do the beef. It's what's for dinner, or the. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, um, so there you go, folks. Uh, hope you enjoyed. I, I never say this, but I hope you enjoyed Edge of Tomorrow. I really enjoyed it. We all did. Uh, so we hope you did. And uh, stay tuned next week for the absolutely cult epic Roadhouse. And that's it. We'll see you next time, folks. Thanks so much. See ya. Bye. And that is going to wrap up this week's episode. You can find the show notes for this episode in your podcast app of oh, choice or at our website, ebd.fm forward slash episodes forward slash 115. If you'd like to support the show, there's a number of great ways you can do it. You can support us on Patreon. That's right. You can throw us a couple bucks. Patreon.com forward slash EBD podcast. You can also rate us and even more importantly, review us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast nuggleberries. And you can also tell a friend to check out the show. Word of mouth, of course, is incredibly powerful and incredibly important. So please share the joy of the show. Follow us on social media, folks. We use the handle at EPD Podcasts everywhere. And we spend a lot of time on Instagram, so come check us out and enjoy us and see more goofy crap that we post. It's great. And uh, that's about it. Thanks for joining us on Edge of Tomorrow. We'll see you next week for Roadhouse. So long, folks. Beedy, beedy, beedy. Two weeks. Stick it in. Pull it out. The taste is going to move you when you pop it in your mouth. Juicy fruit is going to move you. Got the taste. It gets right through you. Juicy fruit. It tastes, it tastes, it tastes. It's going to move you. <laughs> <laughs>